Hello, guys. Welcome to the Newbie Dentist Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Omid Azami. I am releasing part two of the special two-part series with the fantastic Dr. Bruce Freeman today. Uh, part one came out last week. If you haven't checked it out, please do so. It quickly became the most downloaded episode of the Newbie Dentist Podcast. Uh, so I really want to send out my appreciation for Dr. Freeman for being such a great guest and uh, working so hard to promote the episode and get it to more people out there. Um, I really want to thank the listeners. Uh, we're now you know, about 15 episodes in, so we're, we're getting a little bit of uh, momentum slowly. We're downloaded in uh, 35 countries now, which is fantastic. I've had a lot of uh, great messages from people on Instagram who listen to the show and have received some great value, uh, which really makes my day. So I really want to thank you guys for listening. I hope you continue to listen. I hope you can uh, pass this on to your classmates and your colleagues uh, to help the podcast grow. And uh, as always, please, please, please get in touch with me. Give me some feedback. Um, I would love to hear from you guys and see what you enjoy and don't enjoy uh, so we can continue to improve the podcast and make it more enjoyable and more value-filled for you guys. So uh, we're going to jump in and enjoy part two with Dr. Bruce Freeman. Hello and welcome to the Newbie Dentist Podcast, the safe place for newbie dentists to connect, collaborate, learn, and grow. The Newbie Dentist Podcast aims to provide high quality and high value content for all the newbie dentists out there. With your host, Dr. Omid Azami. All right, so, so Dr. Freeman, uh, we're back for part two of our episode today. Um, in part one, we talked about uh, more about like life as a dentist and working outside of dentistry and you know all the things that kind of go along with that. Um, so for part two today, I was hoping to sort of uh, dive in and nerd out a little bit on the dental side of things. Um, and I know like your area of expertise obviously is ortho and uh, working in a hospital with like uh, oral facial pain and TMD patients. Um, and I know that's an area that a lot of dentists uh, – we see this in our everyday sort of practice, you know, people coming in with like uh, worn dentition and like jaw pain. And for the most part, we just, you know, give a night guard and like, let's see how that, how things turn out. <laughs> um, so I was hoping to like, you know, learn a thing or two today and like review this topic with you and see what your sort of uh, mindset is in terms of how to approach a patient with, uh, you know, mild TMD symptoms, um, some red flags of like when we should refer and not like start any treatment. Um, and then sort of we'll take things from there. Perfect. Well, you know, TMD, treatment of facial pain, has become a big thing of late, and there's TMD clinics popping up all over the place. People have to realize that, I know your listeners know because they're all dental professionals, but there is no such thing as a, as a TMJ specialist. I mean, you can become a specialist in oral medicine, oral pathology, or both. Um, the major problem that with uh, oral facial pain and TMD is not realizing what you don't know. Yeah, And I think we talked before in part one, it's easy to know what you know, it's easy to kind of recognize what you don't know, but the scary part is not knowing what you don't know. And if you don't know what it could be, <laughs> then you'll blame everything else. I mean, yes. so many times people say, oh, um, you know, you're grinding your teeth, here's a night guard, but did the patient go for a sleep study? And that's one of the main things people have to recognize when somebody comes into you and they complain of TMJ, TMD symptoms or oral facial pain. The first question, you know, amongst the many questions that we have is, how's your sleep? Mm -hmm. And because chronic power function can be representative of a sleep disturbance. Yeah. And everybody thinks, you know, it's the 500 pound person who's been drinking their whole life who's the, who's <laughs> who has sleep apnea. Yeah. But in reality, you can be, you know, 120 pounds soaking wet and have sleep apnea. One of the things people need to look for in such patients is they have uh, vertical maxillary excess or VME. Yeah. Um, so what that means is during development, the maxilla grew, grew in a very vertical direction, took the mandible, rotated it in a clockwise direction. And as such, you have to think of your airway as a garden hose. So it's not like you're making the airway bigger or smaller. You're essentially stepping on the garden hose. Yeah. And sometimes when people have what we call MMA surgery, maxillomandibular advancement for sleep apnea, it's not just advancing the jaws, but it's also impacting the maxilla, auto-rotating the mandible, and advancing it so that you're not making the airway bigger, you're reopening you're your foot, off, your foot <laughs> off the hose. Yeah. And one of the things that we always tell people is we, we talk about their sleep. When's your last coffee? Do you look at your phone or computer right before bed? Are you downloading Just Get Flux, which is uh, FLUX, which is a free um, app you can download onto your computer? 
and uh, J-U-S-T, G-E-T, F-L-U-X, and it turns your screen blue at night. It, sorry, it eliminates the blue light at night. Yeah. <laughs> so because the blue light at night tells your brain it's daytime and your melatonin levels actually drop instead of rising. Same thing on iPhones have twilight mode. I think Androids yeah. have something similar. Um, people t- simply taking magnesium bisglycinate, B-I-S, Um, Because magnesium citrate can upset your stomach. A lot of people take things called Calm or all these powder concoctions. But there is magnesium before bed. Just being conscious of your caffeine intake, your stress level, etc. Headspace meditation. Yeah. Uh, listening to Andy, you know, before, you know, five times a day to calm yourself down, yeah. breathing exercises. That has a lot to do with it. And patients will actually come back and say, whoa, I didn't realize. Like, I, I thought I was sleeping, but I wasn't getting a good sleep. Yeah. One other thing you can counsel patients on is something called sleep restriction. You'll say that patients will say, oh, no matter what time I go to bed, I wake up three hours later. So we always say, what's your normal wake up time? They'll say six. And I say, I know it sounds kind of crazy. The mother of a patient actually helped me with this. Um, go to bed at about three in the morning. And then the next night, three in the morning, the next night, two thirty, two, one thirty, one, And then all of a sudden you realize, whoa, I slept five, six hours straight. Yeah. So you're not constantly waking up because when people wake up three, four hours into their sleep cycle, they start going to bed at four in the afternoon and thinking, yeah. okay, maybe that'll do it. <laughs> yeah. And that's actually the worst thing. Cause then every time you go to bed, you have this negative relationship with your bed yeah. and you know how everybody falls asleep on the couch and they go to bed at night and they can't, you know, yeah. then they lie there staring at the ceiling. Mm-hmm. So these are, these are things. So when someone comes to you, you first thing, and they have their constantly chronic clenching grinding, it's not just about handing them a night guard, which by the way, most of what I see are badly, I think they hand them out in the waiting room, I don't even think they adjust (laughs) them, Um, which is a problem in and of itself. And also sometimes people give very soft guards, which is like giving someone bubble gum for the evening and wondering why they have pain in the morning. So the most important thing is to ask a lot of questions. You have to ask about their sleep cycle. You have to ask, um, you know, has anybody heard them? snoring a lot or breathing or breathing abnormally there's an app you can download for free you don't need the bells and whistles it's called snore lab yeah and you put it beside yourself or the person you're sleeping with and it'll tell you whether your snoring is mild moderate or epic <laughs> so because some people think the person they're sleeping with says oh I don't snore and then yeah. they you know yeah you want to hear this yeah. <laughs> you know so uh that sort of oh i had no idea and then you'll start and this also affects when you see young children who have vertical maxillary access, retrognathic, etc., that you have to talk about, well, if I treat your child conventionally now and their sleep apnea issues in the future, and we have now a class one malocclusion or occlusion yeah. at that point, and then they say, oh, now we have apnea or I don't like my profile, not only do braces have to go back on, but now you have to take out teeth to recreate the malocclusion yeah. that you camouflage through your orthodontic treatment. Mm-hmm. So people have to be cognizant of sending even younger patients to um, sleep clinics for children to assess whether there's a sleep abnormality now. And who, and you know that kids are on their phones 24-7, which yeah. is a huge issue. So you see, I mean, I've noticed, I mean, not that I have like historic data to like compare this to, but um, I see a lot of kids in our offices and they have like a lot of wear on their teeth. Um, do you think that's because of like diet and like acidity or is it, it like they brux at night? It or? could be diet and acidity. I think that these kids are literally, I always say to them, so you, you put your phone, you turn your phone off like what? Three seconds before you go to sleep. They're like, yeah. And you're like, got you. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the problem. And I always tell parents when they have young kids, when they give them a phone because of safety issues, whatever, when they yeah. walk back in the house, unless they're selling real estate or they're on call for, uh, the operating room, they don't need a phone in the house. Yeah. And you can actually, now there's, um, programs where you can selectively turn off the Wi-Fi okay. of certain devices. Yeah. So if your kid's trying to tax all of a sudden you're dad, mom, my phone's not working <laughs> because you turned off the Wi-Fi. Yeah. <laughs> so that's important. Something important to do because people are wholly overstimulated. And also when you don't get restorative rejuvenating type sleep, your school performance suffers. They did, they did studies where they changed the school start time by an hour and test score shot up. Yeah. So that's something to consider. The other problem is, is this representative of other pathologies? Sometimes patients came in for example, and this is why you really need to know your oral medicine and oral pathology. I had a patient come in, was told he needed jaw surgery and everything. And, uh, I treated his kids, never met him. Mom brought the kids. Yeah. And he said, I said, why are you here? He says, because my wife said, if I don't come to you, don't come home. <laughs> <laughs> so I, we chatted and I looked at him and kind of looked in his mouth a little while he was talking. And then I was looking at him and I said, have your hands always been that big? And he kind of looked at me like I was nuts. <laughs> and he said, yes. I was like, oh, okay. 
take a look inside. His mandible looked expanded to me. It, it, it was just a bizarre looking malocclusion. So I spoke, I said, I'll just be back in a second. Went to his, went to the phone, called his doctor and his doctor said, Oh, maybe he's taking creatine at the gym. And I said, no, this is, <laughs> this is a tumor. Yeah. And I, I said, I bet my life. This is a pituitary adenoma. Yeah. He had just been to the doctor. The doctor kind of brushed away everything, didn't didn't say anything to him, and it turned out this tumor was so large it was already compressing his optic nerve. Wow. And he came back, you know, bearing gifts, which was very generous of him, but he looked like he his whole body changed. And then yeah. he said he remembered looking at photos from the past, and he realized that he had, you know, there was a grandmother, a grandfather with very hard-looking jaws, and, you know, he said, oh, this has obviously been in my family. Yeah. The interesting point about this, you know, my friends and colleagues will say, wow, great pickup. And I said, yeah, but think of all the things we're not picking up yeah. because we just don't know. And that's why a friend of mine who's a neural pathologist, Nadia, she always says, sometimes you do tests because you're looking for zebras mm-hmm. or zebras for some of your listeners. <laughs> um, so sometimes you don't even know what tests to ask yeah. or, or to ask for. And this is why the doctor patient relationship is so essential because if we don't ask a million questions, you can have. 10,000 sophisticated tests, you're not going to know which test to order because yeah. you don't even know which direction you're going in. So when you have TMJ problems or TMD or oral facial pain, I always joke with people, it's so easy because it could be, it could be psychological, infectious, inflammatory, um, pathological, uh, dental. It could be a million things and it could be all those things put together. Just yeah. because someone has neuropathic pain because of a brain tumor doesn't mean they don't also have a TMD problem because of grinding and clenching. It's a matter of parsing out or trying to figure out which thing is which. And what a lot of practitioners have a tendency to do is they'll give you muscle relaxants, anti-inflammatories, a night guard, send you to physio, do all these things. Patient goes back and say, Hey, I feel better, but I think I just spent $3,000 and a lot of my time yeah. and I don't know what worked. Mm-hmm. So you really have to take a step back and think about this. And I spoke to somebody recently who's a dental specialist, also did some training, master's degree, et cetera, in oral facial pain. And we had a long chat. And I said to him, I'm going to ask you three questions yeah. about MRIs and this and the other. And I said, I want you to answer them. And he said, I think I realize I don't know as much as I thought I knew because I'm not doing this on a regular basis. And yeah. I think we talked about that before about the 10,000 hour Malcolm Gladwell thing. Yeah. You know, four hours of, you know, looking for pathology a week is, is one thing, but it'll take you 52 years to become a, yeah. to become a specialist. <laughs> so you have to realize there are things you don't even know you're looking for. Yeah. And that's the scary part. It's like people all of a sudden presenting with illnesses and we don't know what they are because we don't know what the entity is. So we can't test for it because we don't even know what we're dealing with. Yeah. Okay. So that's something that people have to bear in mind. So when someone comes to you, let's make it simple and dumb it down. Yes. Yeah, so you have someone come to you. Yeah, yeah, actionable. Someone comes to you, clenching, grinding. First thing is, hey, how's your sleep? Okay. And then the next step is, let's send you for a sleep study. Okay, you're not sleeping. Let's talk about your caffeine use, your screen use, etc. Because before you do any dentistry, if someone's a chronic clencher and grinder, what do you think is going to happen? It's going to fail. Yeah. It's going to fail. And I, I often see in patients' mouths, and I, and I, and I call it either, you know shotgun dentistry or I call it one night stand dentistry. There's, you know, a crown in one quadrant, yeah. um, some buildups in another, and it's just, there's no plan. It's yeah. just, it's just, everything's kind of thrown in there. So we've gone through the sleep. We've sent the patient for a sleep study. Great. The next step is take models, take, well, we, some people don't like when you say models, take casts. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Cause they're not there. It's not a true representation. It's a cast of the teeth. Dr. Zarb would kill you if you ever said yeah. models. Um, <laughs> So you have casts of the teeth and then compared after three months, do you see excessive wear? Do you see continued wear? Maybe the patient was grinding while in university and is perfectly happy now. Yeah. Because unless you address the, the, the issues behind the clenching grinding, none of your treatment will ever succeed. So the next thing is a lot of patients, especially in their 40s, 50s, and 60s, you've had all this dental grinding. What, what has happened? You've now lost the vertical dimension of occlusion yeah. and to your dental students out there never on an exam say you're going to increase the vertical dimension of occlusion you're returning <laughs> yeah. lost vertical dimension of occlusion 
because you'll see people talking in the chair and you'll see this huge freeway space. Yeah. You know, when they're at rest, their teeth are very far apart. You ask them to say Mississippi, Mississauga. I don't know. What did you ask them to say in Australia? <laughs> There's got to be another yeah. city or something that you asked them or, or whatever. So you look at the vertical dimension of occlusion because maybe they're wearing prosthetics. Maybe they need to be refabricated at a, at a more appropriate vertical dimension of occlusion. Sometimes you can't restore the vertical dimension of occlusion because it means restoring the patient's whole mouth and that's not something they have the money for. That's when you go into symptom control, which means night guards, physiotherapy, etc. A lot of people do Botox now, but Botox wears off and also nobody knows what the long-term effects of chronic administration of Botox are yeah. in terms of potential muscle wasting and such. So that's another issue because when you go to the gym, you play soccer, right? Yeah. So you know there's a proper way to approach the ball, kick the ball, etc. Does anybody ever train you how to chew? No. no. So <laughs> a lot of us are chewing wrong. Yeah. You know, or we rush, or you know, parents yelling at their kids, you know, chew your food. Yeah. Uh, keep your mouth closed. So it's a lot of us don't chew properly, and when you're and you know what happens when you go to kick kick the ball if you're not stable on your non-kicking leg what's going to happen you're going to pull a muscle you're going to fall over mm -hmm. we don't understand that within our the jobs balances, muscle balance exactly yeah. and the muscle imbalances yeah. a lot of headaches a lot of times people people will say they have migraine but it's actually tension headache mm -hmm. i don't know if you've ever gone for massage and the therapist presses on your your traps and all of a sudden you feel like you have a headache mm -hmm. well it's all interconnected in terms of the fascia the muscles the nerves so you have to realize that there's an interconnectedness and that you can have more, more than one problem. A lot of people will say, and this is the worst term that will say, oh, this person's a little crazy. There, there's, there's nothing wrong with your teeth. <laughs> yeah. And as I've said before, it's nothing is not a diagnostic term. Well, I, you know, this is the problem. A lot of patients with these complex oral facial pain problems are by no means do they have a psychological issue. They have a true problem. You just don't know what it is. Yeah. And that's a big issue. Okay. I had a patient once who came with TMD symptoms, talked about it, did some symptom support, but then turned out it wasn't getting any better and he was a mechanic. And I said to him, well, what happens when you're like, your head's in the car? Does it change? And he said, yes. That led to sending him for an ultrasound and, a, and an MRI. Turned out he had a hemangioma deep to his masseter that at certain points during the day was yeah. pressing on the masseter. So it was like a TMD problem. Yeah. So to go back, your patient's in the chair, you've discussed the sleep. You've talked about symptom support. It's very important if someone comes with a click to your office, coming back to what I said where it's nothing is not a diagnostic term. I always explain to people, your disc is like a carpet in front of a door. Sometimes that carpet can block the door. Yeah. And that disc can position out of place. Often if people have clicking jaws, you can ask the patient to protrude their mandible edge to edge, then open and close. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the clicking goes away. And even doing those brief exercises where they keep their teeth edge to edge or as far forward as necessary and open and close eight to 10 reps, eight to 10 sets a day. Sometimes they will come back to you and say, whoa, the cracking is not, <laughs> not bad because yeah. you have to realize your disc is tethered by ligaments. Yeah. Those areas are innervated. And can you imagine if, you're, if your disc is positioned forward and now you're articulating on the ligamentous on the ligamentous tissue, which is innervated. What's yeah, that going to feel like? Yeah, it's not great. <laughs> but the TM the TM joint itself is very adaptable. Re remembering it's not like any other joint because the articular surfaces are not covered with hyaline cartilage. So <laughs> we often find we'll take a look at a panorex. One joint looks terrible. The other looks good, and the pain is on the good side. Yeah. So now you've done your sleep. You've talked about this. You've maybe made a night guard. Etc. But you always have to warn the patient there is no cure for a TMD. Yeah. There's only symptom management, and the natural progression is locking with pain regardless of treatment. Okay. So how long? Um, so once you give the night guard, what's like a good interval to like wait and see how things respond? Let's say a night guard is even indicated because yeah. <laughs> sometimes it's not. Let's be clear. Yeah. But you've done some symptomatic support. You've worked on lifestyle modifications. Let's say you did or did not give a night guard. You want to give things at least a couple months to see. First of all, people. You give them a list of things to do. I always say do one a week because if, if you give them a list and they'll yeah, just yeah, become yeah. overwhelmed, do nothing. It's like yeah. when you're studying in dental school, you see 10 subjects, you just end up, you know, <laughs> on YouTube, <laughs> yeah, on YouTube, you know, streaming a movie yeah. because you just can't focus. So if I give someone a night guard, I'm worried about trying to do something else or I'm thinking there could be another problem. I'll give it at least eight to 10 weeks. Okay. And then you can move to the next step. And I, again, let's say the patient comes to you 
Let's say they don't have any pain, they just have a click. Okay, you can you draw it out. Here's your mandible, temporal bone. I always uh, draw the disc and I say temporomandibular joint. I said this is why we call it TMJ. Mm -hmm. Saying you have TMJ is like saying you have elbow. It's just the name <laughs> of the joint. Okay. Yeah. The residents of the hospital hate like roll their eyes every time I say it. Um, and I show them wh where the disc is, what can happen. I actually draw a door and I draw a little carpet <laughs> and I explain to them this yeah. because they need to know. Because if I come to you and you're going to do whatever, you're going to do two crowns on me and I have a click and you didn't talk to me about all this that my jaw could lock and all of a sudden my jaw locks, what's happened? Yeah. Now we have a big problem, mm -hmm. okay? The other issue is with TMD pain, everybody says soft diet, soft diet, soft diet, which in the beginning is great, but eventually doing cold applications, let's say two minutes on, two minutes off, flushing, it's the Huntington reflex, mm -hmm. flushing the area is very beneficial to sort of regain the strength back to the area. Because a lot of times, you know, when you rehabilitate an injury, what do you do? You take it easy and then slowly, slowly, ramp slowly, up, yeah. you ramp it up. People don't realize in the orthopedic world, if you have a fracture, they don't want you taking anti-inflammatories. Why? Because you're interfering with bone healing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Same thing in orthodontics. We don't want you taking anti-inflammatories because you're slowing the, you're, you're actually negating because tooth movement is what? It's an inflammatory process. Yeah. So that's why we say take Tylenol, mm -hmm. etc. So a lot of times... People forget their doctors of dental medicine or their doctors of dental surgery and they become more technicians and they forget the doctor part, you know, yeah. of what they learned in terms of oral medicine and oral pathology. So after a couple of months, you've done what you can, symptomatic support, etc. Then you move on to the next step. Maybe it's brief pharmacotherapy in form of muscle relaxants like Flexeril or anti-inflammatories. Mobocox is a great anti-inflammatory, um, beneficial for the jaw joint. Slowly but surely trying to figure these things out. Mm -hmm. And then you can move on to, sometimes there's nothing you can do, even with psychological support or cognitive behavioral therapy. Sometimes Botox is even necessary or steroid trigger injections into the muscles of mastication. Yeah. But one of the easiest ways in the chair that you can look at it is if you, if the patient's mouth is closed and you press on their, on their mandible, sort of side to side, superiorly, posteriorly, and it hurts, chances are you're dealing potentially with a joint issue. Yeah. If they passively open themselves and it hurts, well, then it could be, you know, muscular or ligamentous. Yeah. If you're forcing their mouth open, then they're not using their muscles. You're, you're stretching the ligaments. So then it's most likely a ligamentous issue. Yeah. Because if you're, if you're, if the patient's not opening themselves and you're opening the patient, it's very rare that in that one degree of movement that it's a muscle problem. Mm -hmm. But problem is it still could be so you can press on someone's mandible in several directions okay wow a lot of pain maybe it's articular mm -hmm. open and close how it hurts okay it could be muscular and ligamentous forcing the jaw open yourself um and it hurts most likely ligamentous so yeah. you see there's ways to kind of yeah pick out it's what like it testing your ankle <laughs> exactly <laughs> but, which is what happens when you go to the therapist they yeah. go okay press on my active passive, passive, passive yeah, yeah. and you're like does it hurt walking up the stairs going <laughs> down the stairs you're like why are you asking me these yeah. questions so there's a purpose to it yeah um and you have to realize you're dealing with a functional joint and the problem is you eat, you talk, it never gets a rest. Yeah. There used to be a, a neuropathologist in Toronto that used to tell patients to just keep their mouth shut for a month yeah. and uh, just rest your jaw. Yeah. It didn't go over well, but the concept is sort of there. Yeah. But then there has to be this act of rehabilitation, you know, ice on and off, flushing the joint, getting sort of movement back into the area. But the problem is, even though we discussed positioning the mandible, active passive stretching, is it ligament, muscle, um, joint. It can also be ligament, muscle, and, and joint, yeah. <laughs> and it can also be pathologic. Okay. So, what about like the distinction between? Because <clears throat> I know a lot of people come in and like their masters are sore and they're like, "Oh, I have like a clenching problem." So, how do you manage like a clenching parafunction versus like a bruxing parafunction? It might be like you can see it's like different like uh, mechanism of injury kind of. Right. Um, so, do you address it differently, or is there a similar protocol for both? There's a similar protocol. Sometimes, what I will do, and this is something you can even do in your office is the, the muscle that's usually the most exquisitely tender is the coronoid attachment of the temporalis muscle. So everybody has to go back, open up their yeah, anatomy exactly. books and remember where's the coronoid attachment yeah. of the temporalis muscle. And by feeling and palpating that area, you can literally lift the patient out of the chair with light touch saying, okay, so I will take local anesthetic without epinephrine because I want the local anesthetic to spread into the area. And you can do an injection sort of into the area 
of the coronary detachment of the temporalis muscle. So imagine you're doing almost like a gal gates yeah. or almost like an akinosi. So you're going in, in sort of parallel to the mandible, but then you're moving off to the opposing quadrant yeah. just so that you can sort of angle up in a little deep toward the coronoid notch. Injecting the, um, the anesthetic with that epinephrine so it spreads. If all of a sudden the patient says, whoa, that's, that feels better than it's ever felt. Yeah. That's the sign that that muscle has, has had an acute, you know, acute injury or it's a chronic, chronic pain. Yeah. Sometimes depending on the length of time the patient has had the pain, we'll work more in lifestyle modifications, maybe a night guard, maybe a short course of a muscle relaxant to break the cycle. Yeah. Okay. Then we can talk about doing a steroid trigger injection, which you can't continually do that. So you mm -hmm. don't want to do it offhand and then, you know, right, right away. And then sometimes, yes, Botox is a consideration, but a lot of these patients, they've shown that cognitive behavioral therapy and mindfulness treatment has um, changes more profound than even medication. And we had a study recently in our clinic with music therapy and the response from the patients was incredible nice. about how it, they realized when they were clenching, grinding. Some people are clenching, grinding in your chair while you're talking to them. They have no idea. Yeah. And then you hold up a mirror and they're, oh, mm -hmm. you know, their cheeks are you know, pulsating. Yeah. So again, these are sort of initial strategies that you can talk about. So we've talked about the patient coming in, clenching, grinding, talking about sleep, sending them for a sleep study. We've talked about short course of maybe muscle relaxants, anti-inflammatories, a trial injection of a local anesthetic just to see is it more muscle or joint therapies that people are aware of, such as cold, uh, cold applications, um, jaw exercises like we talked about protruding. Yeah. So let's say it's just not making any sense. Or you get the patient who's clenching, grinding, but they also come in with a weird comment that, you know, um, I have pain in this particular tooth. And you look at the tooth and there's an MOBD, element OP restoration yeah. in it. You know, <laughs> like every surface is covered. You look yeah. on the PA, you're, you're, you're seeing the ligament widen as you look at it because you're doing the PDL because you're yeah. trying to think of something. Then you could be veering more off into the neuropathic. Yeah. And this is where dentists get bitten because a lot of times this is neuropathic pain. Yeah. So a lot of times we'll see patients who have had endo on an entire quadrant or close to it. They've had the teeth out and the patient comes and says, there's something stuck between my, my two posterior molars. And you look at them and it's like, you don't have posterior <laughs> molars. So I don't know what you think something's stuck between. Yeah. But when you have atypical facial pain, it's like phantom tooth pain or phantom limb pain. Yeah. Somebody can have their foot cut off, and the, but the nerves that took sensation from the foot to the brain are still intact in the body, yeah. just in a different position. Um, they're all gnarled at the knee, let's say, where an amputation occurred. But patients will wake up and say, my, my foot hurts, but mm -hmm. there is no foot. Yeah. So you'll see this constantly, and we always joke, before you cross the midline doing endo, maybe you should take a step back. <laughs> now, you could give anesthetic to the patient, and sometimes you'll get a bizarre reaction. You'll, you'll anesthetize or freeze the tooth, as we say here, and the patient says... Pain's gone. And you're thinking, I didn't even cap the needle yet. <laughs> so when you get a bizarre, and then they'll say the pain's come back. So when you get a bizarre reaction to local, that's a sign you could be dealing with neuropathic pain. Neuropathic and pain does, in general, does not wake you up in the middle of the night. Yeah. Dental pain will. You know, dental pain gets worse and that's worse. That's a good question to ask. Yeah. So does it wake you up in the middle of the night? Mm -hmm. Because let's say you, don't, you have two teeth. You can't really distinguish which tooth it is. You're thinking it's endo, not whatever. You've done all your tests. You're not 100% sure. Medicate them in the appropriate way. If you see, if you don't see any lesions, you can just give them, a, you know, anti-inflammatories, pain medication, whatever. Mm -hmm. Give it a couple of days because within a couple of days, if it's truly odontogenic, the tooth in question will present itself. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's not. Gonna, That's what I do usually. Yeah, yeah it's not going to go away. Yeah. But some people will do endo first and ask questions later. Yeah. You know, they'll do the two more side by side molars. Mm -hmm. Remembering when you're doing local anesthetic tests on an upper first molar, a maxillary molar. Whenever you, whenever you do an infiltration, you also have to sometimes do it slightly from the mesial because of accessory information, uh, innervation. Some people forget about that. So you've done a local anesthetic test. First, you do all your endo tests. Then you do a local anesthetic test. You're still, oh, I'm really not convinced. Sometimes, no matter what you do, you've done everything. Sometimes you do have to endodontically treat the tooth mm -hmm. because you're just at wit's end. The tooth is so heavily restored. You have to warn the patient this may not help. But by the same token, you don't want to take the tooth out. Yeah. That's a rare circumstance that we do that because 
The patient may say to you, I don't care, I get it, take it out. Your responsibility is to not take it out because you know that it's probably not going to make things better. But these patients become very desperate yeah. and they just want something done. The next step for me in these patients is I refer them, and this is something your listeners can help guide the, doc- the family doctors to because they don't know about this, is the neurosurgeon I work with asks, asks for an MRI of the brain with what's called Fiesta. Not a party, okay. <laughs> capital, all capital Fiesta, letters, yeah. F-I-E-S-T-A. It helps show the blood vasculature, vasculature adjacent to the trigeminal nerve. Yeah. Okay? So in these situations, you have um, vascular compression of the trigeminal nerve. Thankfully, it's not a lesion or a tumor, mm-hmm. but it's vascular compression. And these patients will benefit from decompression surgery yeah. to the point where they become pain-free. Yeah. So neuropathic pain is very insidious. So let's say you do have a patient, you think it could be neuropathic pain, and it's not traditional trigeminal neuralgia. So I always tell the residents, let's do a little bit of a tree diagram. Yeah. Okay, we've done our endodontic testing. We've done our local anesthetic testing. It's not conclusive. If we really think it's not odontogenic and it could be a form of a neuralgia, okay, is it atypical facial pain or is it traditional trigeminal neuralgia where there's a trigger point, etc.? Yeah. Sometimes you can have a prodromal trigeminal neuralgia where the patient feels this chronic weird ache in the background, but it's not that sharp shooting, you know, Nerf electric pain. pain. Yeah. But if you feel it's more of the atypical facial pain variety, then sometimes we will ask the family doctor to start them on a trial of gabapentin, which is an anti-seizure medication which has benefit in managing atypical facial pain. So if the medication works, then we pretty well know maybe this is what we're dealing with. Yeah. Sometimes gabapentin has to be combined with Tegretol, which is used traditionally for trigeminal neuralgia. Another interesting point for your listeners is trigeminal neuralgia treated with Tegretol can be very beneficial, but you need routine blood tests because it can affect liver function. You can become, you can... So this is something that you would generally refer... Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. See, this is the point. As you're saying this, I'm like, yeah. I don't want to do all this. Like, <laughs> that's the whole point when I give a facial yeah. pain lecture. By the end, everybody's like, peace out, I don't want to do all this. So, but that's the point. But there are certain yeah. things, like you've asked me, what can I do to triage the patient? Yeah. So if you see someone on Tegretol, very simply, do you have blood work every month? Mm-hmm. Because you have to assess Tegretol levels. You want to make sure the patient's not becoming neutropenic and that their liver function is fine. Most interesting... The patients that can have the most severe reaction, I believe they get Stevens-Johnson syndrome, uh, patients of Asian background on Tegretol. Mm -hmm. And there's a a genetic test that can be done. So you have to be very careful if a patient's about to go to the neurologist or somebody and get Tegretol for their trigeminal neuralgia and their evasion descent. And this could be anything, especially, you know, you going to school in Australia, there's, I mean, people from all different uh, backgrounds. So you have to be very careful of that. So... Then let's say we do this MRI and we find something. Yes, if it's a lesion, of course that's addressed. If it's a vascular decompression, that can be addressed. So the main thing is when the patient's in your chair, comes in, says, I'm having face pain, etc., alarm bells have to go off in your head. Yeah. Okay? When I was in school, I was taught altered sensation is a tumor until proven otherwise, and I kind of always think that. That doesn't mean you can't get severe muscle pain where you for- sort of feel pins and needly on your face, etc., But the main thing is to determine, just like through the basic movements that we talked about, passive opening, forced opening, shifting the mandible about, are you dealing with a joint tissue, muscle, more ligamentous, etc.? Might they benefit from just seeing a physiotherapist or chiropractor who knows how to get in there and work the muscles? If it's not, and you give a night guard, you've given short course of muscle relaxants, you've even referred them to an appropriate practitioner for Botox, not someone who took the weekend course. Sorry for you people (laughs) who took a weekend course, but someone who's really experienced at it and they're still not getting better, then you have to start thinking maybe there is a neuropathic component. Yeah. And the thing is, you don't do endo first and ask questions later mm-hmm. because that's the biggest mistake you can make. Yeah. There's one other thing I would like to talk about briefly because you want, to, you want people to have actionable plans for Monday is occlusal dysesthesia. Okay. Occlusal <laughs> dysesthesia, not fun. <laughs> this is the patient that comes to you and says, I had this tiny buckle pit restoration and ever since then everything's been off yeah. and and all you need to do is polish this for me well trust me they've been to nine other dentists who they've told the same story to 
They'll come to you, they'll look you in the eye and say, you're the first dentist to really understand my problem. That's the, that's the, that's the biggest red flag. Yeah. <laughs> because occlusal dysesthesia, the patients don't even know what's going on. They don't even understand what it is. They think maybe there's a neural signature where people understand how their bite is supposed to feel, but this person's neural signature is somehow mixed up or exacerbated or heightened so that even the slightest change in their mouth will set them off. Mm -hmm. The worst thing you can do is anything yeah. <laughs> because I've actually had to give the patients, a few patients, this article and read it with them so that they understand. I don't think they're making it up. I don't think it's all in their head. I'm not being dismissive yeah. that this is a true entity that we don't fully understand. And sometimes these patients end up going on gabapentin or whatever, or you just know what not to do. Yeah. So Occlusal dysesthesia patients will suddenly make an appearance. And as dentists, we always think we want to fix everything. This is the time to keep your handpiece and your instruments on the tray table and don't do anything because they will say, oh, you just have to, it's just, just a millimeter, just, 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 just smooth off a millimeter. Yeah. You'll smooth off that millimeter and they will come back to you every and say, day. you've ruined their life. <laughs> no, they'll say you've ruined their life. In yeah. addition to coming back every day, you'll see them on their, on your schedule for the rest of your, yeah. your natural life. Okay. <laughs> Unless you move yeah. or they move yeah. and then it becomes a geographic success. The patient <laughs> left. So these are things that you have to be careful of. Is it muscular? Is it joint? Is it muscular and joint? Is there a neuropathic pain component? Is the patient waking up in the middle of the night? Unlikely with a neuropathic pain component, unless there's a trigger, sometimes they'll sleep in a funny way or their partner will hit them in the face, you know, accidentally. Yeah. If it's neuropathic, it's, it's, you know, you have to be able to guide the physician and say, hey, you know, this is what I think it is. I've done some reading. Um, this is the MRI image that needs to be done. Interestingly, I just had a lady who had a Chiari malformation, which here, everybody can look that up again. I'm going to go through it with you. Um, she developed persistent or chronic pain. Did an MRI. The MRI said no direct vascular conflict. I still wasn't convinced because her symptoms, sometimes, you know, again, you got to go with your gut. Yeah. Sent it to the neurosurgeon. She looked at the images. She said there was an issue. She operated. And now this woman's pain is finally abating after, I think it's been 15 years. Wow. The funny thing is I called her on the phone. She was very appreciative. And, and she said, I hope you don't take this the wrong way. But when anybody asks who solved the problem, I tell them it wasn't a doctor, it was a dentist. <laughs> so we all have the ability to find the strange and, you know, scary things yeah. that physicians sometimes miss. Mm -hmm. And that's why when a patient comes to you complaining of facial pain problems, etc., you have to look at the occlusion, you have to probe, you have to, you have to touch every tooth. And that's why people who open these clinics or, or say, oh, yeah, I love to treat TMD patients. Good luck. I don't do them in my practice. We do it in a hospital clinic because I need access to testing specialists. Yeah. And it's not something that you earn a living doing yeah. properly. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's something you have to approach very carefully. Okay. So I wanted to, um, the next, I want to just get a little bit more detail on is obviously like with the protocol that you kind of went through right now, like the splint and the, the night guard is still a portion of it. Um, and I know there's, you know, different kinds, different, you know, softnesses, hardnesses. Uh, there's like ones with ramps. There's ones that are like flat, like monoplane occlusion. Um, there's like the anterior deprogramming ones. Um, so I'm curious to see like, and I, I feel like we never have, I look it up and I, I still can't get like good answers of like, like and maybe there is no like hard set rules of like this for this. this I'm going to stop that. you right yeah. there. There is no answer. Yeah. <laughs> okay. There was a there was a study by Gilles Lavigne from Montreal L A V I G N E and Tuan Dao D A O. It's a it's a it's a landmark study so to speak. Yeah. Where they showed they gave patients um a, you know a flat plane splint an hour before the appointment. One and then a different group wore the night like every night, and then another group wore a palatal coverage splint, which essentially did nothing, just covered your palate. Yeah, what was the treatment difference? Nothing, nothing. <laughs> Everybody, you know, you get 10 dentists in a room and ask their opinion on night guards, you get 47 opinions. Yeah. Okay, so I'm not about to have people writing in and saying, Whoever this guy is, he's a moron. Yeah, okay. We use neutral, flat, plain, hard acrylic appliances, period. Yeah. I don't like personally the idea of the appliances in the anterior only because as an orthodontist, patients wear these, they come back, massive open bites, all yeah. sorts of dental, you know, compensations that you don't want, reverse smile line, like mm -hmm. real nightmares. Yeah. Um, 
flat plane splints. Let's say you do a lower splint that looks like where there's, uh, I don't want to use names, so there's an acrylic splint with just a lingual bar mm -hmm. and nothing to touch the incisors. That's essentially an orthodontic appliance. That's a bite block. So yeah. that can cause intrusion of the buccal segments, deepening of the bite if worn improperly for a prolonged time, etc. cetera. Yeah. Same thing with an anterior bite plane. What happens to the posterior teeth? Super, Super eruption, you get an open bite. <laughs> One millimeter of change in the posterior equals 2.8 millimeters in the anterior. So it doesn't it take much. Quick. It adds up exactly. Good one. <laughs> I like that. It does add up fast. You know, it's like dog ears. Yeah. You know? So uh, it's way ahead. Yeah. So these are things that you have to be careful of. The ones that we tend to make are flat hard acrylic nightguards for the upper arch or ones on the lower that are, are in a horseshoe, but there's there's acrylic covering the single limb of the lower incisors. Mm -hmm. We never tell patients to wear them during the day. Unless it's an acute, acute problem. Anterior repositioning splints, yes, there's a whole segment of people out there that still believe in those and then restoring an occlusion completely into this new position. Yeah. That's, you know, you have to look at the research. You have to look also what uh, your your licensing body bases their opinions on in terms of what's considered standard of care, etc. A lot of people will say, well, this works in my hands, the three words I hate when people say, this works in my hands. Well, yeah. it's not working in that person's hands or that person's hands, so it's a bit of a problem. But there's too many opinions here, and I'm not going to say one's good or bad or whatever. Yeah. I'm just saying what I do. Okay. So we use flat, plain, hard acrylic splints. On the lower, we'll tend to put a metal mesh so people don't bash through them. Also think when you're making a guard, this is for the new dentist graduating. Let's say there's a tipped molar. You make the guard in the other arch. So now the yeah. teeth are going to continue to tip. <laughs> or somebody you say, hey, are you wearing orthodontic retention? Yeah, I still wear an upper retainer. Make them an upper guard. Mm -hmm. Or there's an unopposed tooth. Think of these things before you just prescribe the guard. Yeah, just like blanket lower. Yeah, here it is. They're yeah. in the waiting room. Here you go. Yeah. Have a great day. <laughs> so you want to make sure that there's even contact. We ask that we we always look at the occlusion when the patient's lying back because that's how they sleep. You know, when you sit up, that's your occlusion yeah. feels different. Yeah. Okay. And we also take the bite registration in that position. This whole thing about, well, I take a CR bite. Well, if you can routinely find where someone's CR position is, you're, you're better than 99.9% .9 of us. Yeah. You know, so that's something to consider. You just want a standard bite to make sure. And then you may have to adjust it. I don't understand when people say, well, I had my night guard adjusted every week for about three months. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, how much was each adjustment? And then, I, then I'm wondering, is this a financial thing or is this a necess necessity? Because we adjust the guards the day they come in and almost never have to really do anything yeah. unless we see something. So what are you looking for when you do that? Is it just you're looking for like balance contact like throughout? If it's a maxillary guard, yeah, you want to see those beautiful little dots yeah. all the way around. Some people will say we want cuspid guided, but the problem is when you do that, you have to realize – You've got the plastic, you're cuspid guiding on plastic. Now your mouth is open hugely. The amount of force at night is something like 300 pounds per square inch. So do you really want that much force on your cuspid only? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, you want something flat. Bounce it so up. I always say that your teeth move around like ice on a table. And again, everybody's going to be taught something different. Everybody's got a different opinion. There's no hard and fast rule. Please don't write in. To the newbie dentist <laughs> saying the guy we talk about night guards doesn't know what he's talking about. Yeah. There's everybody's got a different idea. Yeah. But as an orthodontist, I'm a little nervous when I see bite blocks and anterior bite planes yeah. as orthodontic appliances. So another, I mean as yeah. TMD appliances. Sorry. But I think another controversial one, and I've had this debate, uh, is you know with the uh, like sleep appliances, like the anterior position was everyone's like well it's going to affect the occlusion and like what's worse like having like sleep apnea or having like a mal well, occlusion you like know an edge to edge mal occlusion or death most people <laughs> would choose the edge to edge yeah. mal occlusion and this is the problem there are with sleep appliances people tend to have a day appliance as well to sort of relax you know they wear for a few hours in the morning to relax the musculature because what happens is you get muscle splinting mm -hmm. okay and that or you get dental changes potentially that 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 lock the jaw into one position. This is why, number one, you need to have a proper sleep exam, not necessarily strapping some gizmo on that some rep told you about and sending them home. You need a proper physician-monitored sleep study. Yeah. Not something, like I said, that you take home on the weekends and say, oh, you have sleep apnea. Let me make you this. Mm -hmm. Okay? So with those appliances, are they the gold standard for management? No. For mild sleep apnea, maybe. That doesn't have to fully advance the mandible, great. But in general, a CPAP is the gold standard. Yeah. And in general. 
And also, a lot of patients I've had as an orthodontist have ended up having MMA surgery, which is maxillomandibular advancement. Mm -hmm. And again, that comes back when you're looking at what the orthodontic plan is. You've got a patient with vertical maxillary access, rotated down and back mandible, and you're thinking, okay, how am I going to manage this? And the kid's 16, but what if I treat this now and they develop apnea at 25? So these are the conversations you have to have. And we send the patients for a sleep study. I don't care if they're 14, 15. You go yeah. for a sleep study. We want to establish things now. So sometimes the parents will say, okay, again, the tree diagram. Yeah. Sleep study positive for sure. We're just going to wait and do surgery and everything later. Sleep study negative now becomes an aesthetic issue. And then we say, well, how severe is the malocclusion that we don't feel we can man- we can camouflage it, we can get you a B-plus result yeah. non-surgically, or we can go for an A. Yeah. But again, as I said, if you treat somebody with a potential apnea in the future, pretend, let's say they develop it, and you've treated the occlusion to essentially an ideal where there's no overjet, good overbite, well, if you need surgery in the future, you're going to have to recreate that overjet, yeah. you know, which is a much more complex thing. So this is about you counseling your patients because if the orthodontist or oral, if the orthodontist sends you the patient and says take out these teeth, you can't just blindly take out teeth. Yeah, you have to understand what the, the treatment plan, plan is. is, and if somebody's not sending you a full report with all the options of what what's been presented to the patient, don't take out the teeth. Yeah, and I know oral surgeons who have lost referrals because of that because they stood their ground and justifiably so because they'll send me an X ray and you know some dental photos and. I, and the surgeon will say, I was asked to take out these teeth. Oh, whoa, <laughs> you know, you better talk to the patient because yeah. that's a massively surgical malocclusion. Someone's trying to camouflage. Yeah. Do they understand that? Sometimes the, the surgeon will say, you know, was this presented to you a surgical plan? They're, no. Mm-hmm. And then you have a problem because you take those teeth out. Then no you've done the patient them. a huge disservice. Mm-hmm. And now you've taken them down almost, you know, not that you can't sort of put teeth back in with implants. But essentially, let's be honest, you you can't put the teeth back. So you've gone down the wrong road and you've really harmed the patient. And that's something to consider. That's great. Um, So I just want to uh, change it up quickly and um, give you a quick few quick uh, ortho, like rapid Uh, rapid fire. Rapid fire ortho. Uh, (laughs) um, Just like general guidelines, not for treatment, but more so for like when to refer. Um, So I I know like when I see kids, I have this like added pressure because I know like, you know, someone's like like nine or 10 or 11 and I'm very like cognizant of the fact that like the decision I might make like regarding treatment is gonna like affect like their whole life like dentally. So I'm always like I'm always like very uh, referral happy with kids. Maybe adults I'm like I'll do the endo because like, I need to try it and learn it. But with kids I'm like I don't want to mess things up long term. So what like red flags or things that you will see clinically are like I have to refer to this thing right away. Like for a kid, like this is the thing because there are some, some people ascribe different things in terms of treatment plans, in terms of growth modification, et cetera. The major thing is if you have a class three patient, let's, let's go easy there. You have a kid that comes in at the age of five, who's class three and true underbite, send them right away. Because even though I'm not going to do something right away, I'm going to jump in at the right time because Growth modification with face mask therapy, et cetera, can become very beneficial and actually get a true change, not just a dental change, which is what only happens as you get older. Yeah. When you see them young, at a young age and you started at even six or seven, okay? Mm-hmm. And depending on the, on, the, on the patient's development, sometimes you'll have a kid come in and go, hey, how are you doing? <laughs> Kid's seven, yeah. you know, and he's shaving. Yeah. So, you know, you've missed the growth, you've missed the growth yeah. opportunity. <laughs> So class threes send immediately, even if it's just to meet the orthodontist and understand what can be done and what will happen if you're late. The other major problem that people have is they forget the eruption schedule. Yeah. And the major thing that we see is we see the upper cuspids, sometimes lower as well, the upper cuspids coming in at 45 degree angles and the kid's 14. Yeah. And, oh, the ortho, the dentist said not to go to the orthodontist until all the teeth fall out. Well, that may be the fifth of never, ma'am, because <laughs> those primary cuspids are not falling out. Yeah. Very often removal, and yes, there's some controversy about this, but the research is quite, quite solid. Re- early removal of the maxillary primary cuspids and primary first molars. There's yeah. lots of research yeah, about serial it. Serial attractions. Yeah. yeah. Not necessarily going towards permanent removal, yeah. but primary removal but Chetty, B-A-C-C-E-T-T-I, there's tons of information written by him and other, another orthodontist about this. 
um, can help definitely change the course and prevent impactions. Yeah. Because I've had patients come to me at 16, still have C's in place, and I look and my heart drops, and I think to myself, I hope 1, 3, and 2, 3 are missing. Yeah. I hope those cuspids aren't there, because if they are there, wow, this is a major problem. Yeah. And I had a case not long ago came to me just like that. She was 17 years old, and we ended up exposing six teeth. Yeah, wow. And that's a huge surgery, huge cost, yeah. huge everything for the patient. So when they're young, it doesn't hurt you at the age of seven or eight. Even the American Association of Orthodontists says this and people think, oh, they're just trying to get patients. It takes the responsibility out of your hands into the hands of somebody who knows. And also that's about working with your orthodontist. If you find there are so many orthodontists put four upper braces on, we call it upper lower two by four, which means... <laughs> braces on the molars and the forefront teeth. Mm -hmm. They call it phase one treatment. They give the kid a retainer and then they come back when all the teeth are in and then they put full braces on. So mm -hmm. that's not something I do. That's something other people do. That's fine. Yeah. But unless there's inadequate space, unless you need to regain space, unless you need to widen a narrow jaw, mm -hmm. some form of growth modification, space maintenance, etc., there's not a lot of really phase one treatment that I and a lot of... Um, orthodontists today will do. Um, there are some people use headgear still. If you can get a kid to wear it, it still works amazingly, yeah. but it's just not very popular. Yeah. And in terms of other growth modification devices, I don't want to touch on that right now because that gets a little complicated, yeah. but class threes in particular, as early as possible. If the kid's four years old, send them for a consult. It doesn't yeah. hurt. This way the orthodontist knows I'm going to see this kid every four to six months. And the minute I think I'm ready, boom, going to jump in. Expansion. Expansion, you don't want to do it too, too early, but you also want to get in there in the appropriate time because the older the patient gets, the more difficult it is to expand. There are new methods of expansion with TAD-assisted expanders, but you don't want to be going that route if it was something very simple. Yeah. Space maintenance, space regaining. I still remember I had a very good dentist, and he sent the sister, and the brother was standing next to me. He was all fascinated by this, and He's talking, and I, he wasn't sent. The mother said, oh, no, they said he's fine for now. And I, he's talking, and I'm looking at his mouth. And then I realized he had two beautiful rows of teeth, but inadequate space for the cuspids. Yeah. But they were two beautiful rows of teeth. So he had essentially 15 millimeters of crowding in each arch, yeah. but it looked great. And <laughs> if somebody's coming in for a quick hygiene check or the hygienist, it can easily be missed. Yeah. So this is a kid that ended up having, you know, serial extraction, four by cuspid removal, etc. So the earlier you can send somebody, it takes it off the plate. But don't just send. Ask the orthodontist that you're working with, what is your philosophy? Yeah. You don't want everybody coming back with upper and lower braces on that don't, you know, just to organize a few incisors only to end up putting full treatment on later. Yeah. A friend of mine has opened up in the U.S. and, you know, is Canadian trained little bit different philosophy where she where she was educated she's putting so many patients on recall the dentists are calling and saying well why aren't you doing anything mm -hmm. and she said because <laughs> there's nothing to do yeah. <laughs> you know there's nothing that needs to be done at this time yeah so you have to remember you know dentistry is about fee for service making a living and certain things drive certain people's treatment plans um people have different philosophies so you don't want to you don't want to say anything against what anybody's doing if, as long as they can back it up with research and appropriate, you know, um, arguments as to why they're doing it. But in general, cross bites, class threes, eruption abnormalities, those are things you want to get on. You don't want a 14 year old coming to you with still having their C's in place. Yeah. So it does nothing to refer them. And if you say to the parent, look, I just want you to go, it may be way too early but I just want you to go so that this is monitored so that you don't miss the boat. Yeah. In fact, one of my best, best referrers is an amazing dentist. And sometimes she'll send the patient and I said, well, what did the dentist say? The dentist looked in the mouth, said, I don't know what needs to be done, but I know it needs to be done now. <laughs> and she's an amazing referrer that way. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I had one mother very similarly went to this dentist with her son who she never thought it was a new patient to him. They, one, some kids were going to one dentist, some another, you know, yeah. everybody's going all over the place. Takes it to the, takes the kid to the dentist, class three, about nine years old now. Yeah. And she said, I've never seen that look on her face. <laughs> and I realized I better get, I better get to you right away. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because she saw a look of terror on her face mm -hmm. thinking like your kid's not, you know, we like, you yeah. really got to deal with this. So it doesn't hurt to refer. Now, in terms of doing your own orthodontics, it's very funny. I had a general dentist come visit the office. 
you can become good at anything the more you study. Yeah. Okay? She came to the office. We were talking about Invisalign. She's looking at all our Invisalign cases, and she was looking at all the attachments, and I saw her brow furrow, and I said, <laughs> what's wrong? She goes, what is all that? And I said, she goes, is this Invisalign? I said, yes, but we design our own attachments. We do this. We do that. Oh. <laughs> so then I said, let me ask you a question. You're expanding. You're doing some gentle arch expansion. What do you tell Invisalign to do to your buccal segment teeth? Mm-hmm. She's a she looked at me and she goes, what do you mean? I said, well, you have to realize you're getting more of a tip. So now you've tipped your crown out buckly. What are you telling Invisalign to do? I said, you have to ask for buckle root torque. Mm-hmm. Well, how do you ask for that? How much? I said, well, it depends on much your expansion. You're expanding. Well, what attachments do you use? I said, well, you can't use the typical. <laughs> so all of a sudden, you know, the blood's rushing out of her face. And she, yeah. she's done a couple cases. She's looked at me and she goes, I'm not doing this anymore. <laughs> you know, because again... You don't know what to look for, so you think yeah. everything's you don't fine. Know you don't know. Yeah. You don't know what you don't know. It's just so many people you'll know on Instagram, and we were just chatting about that. They'll post endos and they'll say, "Hey, look what I did!" And you show it to an endodontist. The endodontist is like, "Whoa, yeah. that's not so good." Mm-hmm. So you have to be able to, if you're going to do specialty level work, you have to do it at a special specialist level, yeah. because that's also how you'll be judged if it doesn't go well. Mm-hmm. But it's not about it's not about working to think about how you cover your backside. It's about what's the right thing for the patient. And there are general dentists that do great endo, great everything, because they've taken a million extra put courses. The time, yeah. They put in the time, mm-hmm. exactly, to learn that skill. And yes, there are some general dentists that do amazing orthodontics and amazing endodontics and amazing implants, but they've spent hundreds of hours of working, working, working yeah. to get to that level. It's not just taking a weekend course at the Holiday Inn where yeah. you left at three o'clock because you wanted to go to the gym and then <laughs> on Monday morning you're putting in implants. Yeah. Because so many people you know will put in an implant, they'll get an infection, they'll call the periodontist or oral surgeon. Mm-hmm. If you can't handle the infection, don't put in the implant. Yeah. You have to be able to manage the complications, right? Right. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, because one dentist called me and said, oh, I just finished my first Invisalign case. What should I do for retainers? I said, do you have 48 hours? And he said, why? Because I said, that's like a two-day conversation. <laughs> I said, it's not, there's not just, I said, what was the original malocclusion? Yeah. Well, what did he have now? What did you do? Where did you move? And, mm-hmm. and oh, yeah, no concept because that's not what they were trained to do. So it's not, I'm not trying to be dismissive or say like, you should know better. They, they didn't know better. So my responsibility is to educate them and say, you need to educate yourself more on these facets Mm -hmm. in order to move forward. So with orthodontics, because I have a group of people, we discuss cases together. Our group has been practicing for over 120 years. Yeah. That's a long time. time, We still get stumped. Mm -hmm. Okay. There are still cases where we look at and we're thinking, I don't even know where to begin. Mm -hmm. So you have to realize all specialists get stumped. All specialists ask other specialists, what, what do you think you should do? So with orthodontics, because um, I don't know if I joked with you before, you know, we used to have, everybody has that course, oral anatomy and occlusion. We used to call it oral mystery and illusion because <laughs> nobody knew what the heck they were doing. Yeah. You know, grind this, grind that, hope for the best. You yeah. know, nobody knew. <laughs> so with orthodontics, you have to realize each orthodontic case, everybody who does orthodontics, I say, do you do full mouth reconstructions? No, oh, no, I, I, I don't do that. I send that out. Mm-hmm. What are you doing when you're doing orthodontics? Yeah, same thing. <laughs> it's a full mouth reconstruction because you're changing the position potentially and the way in which every single tooth in the mouth fits. Yeah. So you don't want to miss an eruption problem. And that's why the biggest thing, if I can tell your listeners, is Monday morning, take a look at all the kids. If you have a panorex, don't just take the panorex and put it in the chart or you know, just look at it on the screen and file it away. But look at the a path of eruption of the four cuspids. Yeah. Because then you may say, uh oh, primary extraction, maybe with um if you if you take out the upper C's and D's in a patient, you don't need usually any form of space maintenance in the lower arch. Sometimes you do, so yeah. it's important to understand you just don't take the teeth out. Yeah. Because sometimes you'll see crowded lower incisors and people will take out primary cuspids. And the parent will say, oh, look how straight the teeth are. I said, well, the crowding didn't disappear. It's now just, you've just moved it a little further posteriorly. Yeah. So now you've blocked out some other teeth. Yeah. So it just doesn't evaporate. So in terms of action on Monday is looking at the eruption path of the cuspids, considering referral to an orthodontist. Talk about the removal of primary cuspids and primary first molars to prevent further impaction of those teeth. Mm-hmm. Looking at malocclusions that are severe, such as 
severe deep bites or class threes. Sometimes severe deep bites, let's say the patient's waiting for a surgical correction in the future, that's been the decision. Yeah. What can you do in the meantime? That patient should be wearing something at night to prevent them bashing away at their palate, you know, yeah. with their lower incisors. So again, that's something that you as the general dentist see them all the time. One other thing that, that is important for dentists is when you do your recall exams, particularly on growing patients, overbite, overjet. Because so many times you don't you you get a patient and everybody's gonna see these patients that get JRA, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, and all of a sudden they were at you know, zero over one millimeter overjet, now they're at three, four, five, six. And the yeah. orthodontist or the surgeon will call and say, What was the overjet a year ago? And then you look a little silly realizing you never recorded it. Yeah. Okay. So that's something to be aware of because the mandible will slowly start to, to move itself back. One other thing is when patients, like we talked about, vertical maxillary excess patients, yeah. rotated down and back mandibles, how's the sleep? You know, pair. Mothers, we see this all the time. Mothers will look at you and go, that's interesting you asked that. He's actually a terrible sleeper. Yeah. So then you go through your lifestyle modifications about screen use and everything. Still no improvement. Then you need to see the ear, nose, and throat specialist and your pediatrician or family doctor needs to send you for a sleep study. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. Those are important things to be, to be aware of. For sure. Um, in terms of other orthodontic issues, again, eruption abnormalities, Class threes, expansion is a big thing. A lot of people wait too long for expansion. So to answer your question, you're actually doing your patients more of a service. Yeah. Because for you to send the patient at seven and say, hey, let's just make sure there's nothing going on. <laughs> and then I know that you have my peace dog. of mind. Yeah. You have peace of mind. Exactly. But it's important that you understand the orthodontist to whom you send, what their philosophy is, whether everybody seems to be getting two phases of treatment no matter what, or everybody's getting tons of retainers that they maybe don't need, et cetera. So these are things that you have to consider. Yeah. And I always tell people when they're referring to a specialist, don't ever refer to an office you've never visited. Yeah. That's the best thing to do. Because you want to see how the patients are treated in recovery at the oral surgeons or how they're given instructions and everything. And it's about informing the patients fully about what the, what the risks are and what can happen in the future. And just a quick story, I just had a, fan, I just had a uh, medical resident come in. We actually had a day where everybody was a medical resident. Yeah. So this young lady came in and she said something that she's supposed to get graft, but she backed off. And we said, well, what was the issue? She said, well, he came in and said, you need a graft. Um, you can come back in these many weeks and do it. And she's thinking, well, are you going to talk to me about this graft? Yeah. <laughs> or is it just, I need a graft? Yeah. And she says, well, what are the risks? Oh, it's going to be perfect. It's, it's an easy area. It'll work out perfectly. She goes, well, what's the recovery? Like, where do you take the tissue from? Yeah. She had all these questions. And so she looked at us. She said, I'm not going to go to the practitioner who looks at me and said, you need a graft and walks out of the room. Yeah. So you have to realize what may seem simple and common and every day in your head is not common and every day in the patient's head. So to take it full circle back to the first thing we talked about, when a patient comes in and on their initial exam, they have a click. It's not just, it's nothing, don't worry about it. Yeah. Show them the protrusion exercises. Draw out the anatomy of the TMJ. Warn them no matter what you do, you know, locking with pain can occur. This way, the patient is forewarned and forearmed. And they understand, hey, oh yeah, my jaw was sticky after our last appointment. Thank God you told me I would, because I, I panicked, you know. Mm -hmm. But then I remember you told me this can happen. Yeah. You know, that's the best thing. And yeah. that's the because being forewarned is the best is is the most important. Nobody yeah. likes to be surprised yeah. unless it's a party. <laughs> Even then, some people don't like to parties. But well, yeah, I think that's that's a we covered a lot of good stuff in that episode and um, a lot of like dense topics. But I think it's necessary because uh, it's something that necessarily we're not doing on our day to day basis. And when it comes in the door, um, I think it's it's like you said, like the tree diagram, the tree maps. Um, you got to decide like what kind of clinician you want to be, what kind of dentist you want to be. Either like you're going to put in the time, you're going to sit there and like study on weekends and evenings and read journal articles and, and have enough of a basis to like approach these and tackle these cases. Um, or you're like, I don't, like, I don't care about TMD. I want to be a restorative dentist. I want to do this and that. And then you know to refer it. Um, so it's nice to like have some actionable plans for people who want to listen and or are listening and want to like dive into it deeper and learn a bit better. 
And for other people, we're just like, okay, now I know what the red flags are. Let me just refer every kid at seven and have the piece and of not, yeah, that I'm not yeah. doing anything wrong. Yeah, exactly. And I'm not saying don't try and do or you know, if you want to do some orthodontics, speak to orthodontists. I'm not saying, yeah, send every patient to an orthodontist. Yeah. You know, there's people who roll their eyes at that. That's not what I'm saying. Yeah. But if this is not what you want to do, then know when to send it. There's a great, there's a great uh, Instagram um, uh, profile. His name is Ronan Finn Fitness, F-I-N-N. R-O-N-A-N, F-I-N-N, fitness. Yeah. This guy's in Ireland. This guy studies more than anybody I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> this guy reads more than anybody. And I've actually messaged him. He sent me articles or podcasts. I've learned a ton of things. Mm-hmm. I stopped using the foam roller all the time. Now yeah. my knees don't hurt as much, etc. So I look at this guy and he's a, he's a personal trainer and he is so committed to doing the right thing. Yeah. And he studies, studies, studies. And he studies about stuff he knows he's just not good at. Yeah. But dentists tend to say, oh, I took this course or the rep came in and said, this is so easy. Easy, easy endo. Yeah. Easy endo. <laughs> you just use these four steps and everything's <laughs> great. But that's not the reality. Yeah. You know, so you have to decide which direction you're going to go, what you're going to do well. The easiest thing in the world to be is a specialist because you're only focused on doing one thing. Yeah. The hardest thing in the world to be is a general practitioner because yeah. you have to be good at so many things. So decide what, you know, a lot of my colleagues and friends who are great general practitioners, they don't do endo because they're like, I never got good at it. I never wanted to get good at it. Mm-hmm. I, I can't do it the way my endo colleagues do it. So why am I going to do it? Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? The other thing I will always warn younger dentists about is you're not great at endo. You don't love doing endo. Please do my endo. You get forced into doing it because you, you feel bad for the patient. Mm-hmm. The endo fails. Guess what? They're going to be angry with you and they're going to look in your eye and go, well, you should have told me you, you couldn't do this properly. And yeah. you're saying, but I did tell you, <laughs> but I was trying to help you out so you wouldn't have to spend this money or go to this other doctor. So at the end of the day, for younger practitioners, stand your ground. If it's not something you feel comfortable doing, don't do it. Yeah. When in doubt, refer it out. Yeah. Because that is, that is what is in the patient's best interest. That's number one. Number two, it's in your best interest. Mm-hmm. You know, so that you don't end up doing something or missing something because there's two sins in the world, sins of omission and sins of commission. So you can either do the wrong thing or you can miss something. Yeah. And we don't want to do either. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks so much. That was a great episode. And uh, we'll, hopefully we'll, down the line we'll do another one. We'll do a part three. <laughs> we'll see what comes we'll up in the future. We'll think of something good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so thank you so much, Dr. Freeman. Thank you.